So on this panel, um, the last speaker is uh, certainly not least is um, Jeff Campbell. He's my colleague at the park. He's a park ranger and a researcher. Um, and his topic is Sand Creek Massacre, Myth and Misconceptions. Jeff. Thank you, Karen. Um, these are very solemn, very solemn subjects we're talking about here today. So I want everyone in the audience to take a breath because it sounds like everyone's been holding their breath. Uh, take a breath, please. I would ask the tribal members here that I may speak of their ancestors. Uh, the other ranger that's here today, Craig Moore and I, we speak of the deceased relatives and uh, in respect to the tribal members and their families, we ask that they give us permission to speak of their deceased ancestors. First, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the impact that the other panel members have had on my understanding of the Sand Creek Massacre. Dr. Gary Roberts, Dr. David Hallis, and other speakers here today, Mr. Tom Meyer, Mr. Craig Moore, Dr. Richard Littlebear, Dr. Ari Kilman, Norma Gorno, and Henry Littlebear, Littleberg, and the moderators, Dr. Alexa Roberts and Tribal Liaison Karen Wild. It's also been a very great pleasure for me this morning, for the first time, to hear Dr. Mann speak. Uh, a real pleasure. Thank you. Uh, if we had more time, I'd like to thank the tribal representatives that have impacted what I do at the site, which is tell their story. And it's a great story to tell. It's a solemn story to tell. And they have all impacted personally on my understanding of all of us as human beings. My commentary today is based on 14 years of primary resource, source research as a criminal investigator, combined with the hard realities of digging for elements of the crimes through corroboration sufficient to rise to the level of probable cause. Two of the guiding lights uh, for me are, were, and I would open with two quotes, that facts do not cease to exist because they are ignored, Aldous Huxley. In Dorothy Gardner, a Colorado author's uh, book entitled The Great Betrayal in 1949, in the last chapter, in the last lines, she writes, no one invented Sand Creek or Shivington and the Hundred Dazers. No one invented Black Kettle and Ed Winecoop and Silas Sol or Squires, the man who shot uh, Sol, or young Lieutenant Cannon who died in the Tremont house. Any man who cares to turn the yellowed pages of the Rocky Mountain News to dig in the weighty records of congressional and army investigations may read the story for himself. Vindicate Sand Creek? Some things can never be vindicated. My portion of this panel addresses to some degree the power of words. Synonyms like redskins, savages, heathens, Red Devils, Red Rebels, lay within the causes of the massacre, used as propaganda to incite uh, sentiment against and abrogate the humanity of the Cheyennes and Arapahoes and keep the public fear stoked up in Colorado Territory of 1864. Remember, this occurred during the fourth year, the fourth year of the American Civil War. From the Union perspective, the Cheyennes and Arapahoes, as Red Rebels, also served to associate those tribes with the secessionists, thereby as aiders and abettors of the Confederate traitors. As a consequence of the actions against the tribes, misconceptions have been engineered to sway or divert opinion uh, from the accurate telling of the history. Words have been used to dictate our perceptions about the importance of the massacre into pro and con camps. It is hard to believe that a demeaning and derogatory word like redskin continues to be used along symbols of Native Americans. Of all the events in American history, this is one of the most manipulated stories. Since the day of the inexcusable attack, 
which was founded in a series of betrayals and misdirections. It has been portrayed as everything from an unnecessary and glorious victory to a carnival of carnage. Much of what we are told or read or read about Sand Creek, the Sand Creek Massacre is far from accurate. And intentionally or unintentionally, it deprives us of the tools to understand or discern what the truth of Sand Creek is. This presentation isn't about telling you guys the truth. This is for you to decide. This isn't about rewriting history. This is about getting it right or accurately and to counter what another respected writer recently called or told me, he used the phrase, willful ignorance. Within the mil millions of words written, testified to, studied, examined, and rewritten, most have been composed out of misplaced sympathy or focus on the writer's own conceptions of what makes, a, what makes and who deserves empathy. For instance, to establish unnecessary sympathy early in the tale, the Cheyenne, Distastas, and Arapaho, Hinane, I hope I pronounced those all right, a uh, village of about 750 people is often characterized as the unsuspecting and sleeping village. This diminishes who these people really were. It inadvertently makes them see, seem to be layabouts, not the Anglo-American's idea of Ben and Franklin and Puritan ethic, you know, early to bed, early to rise. In fact, these Plains tribes, like others including the Sioux and Comanche, had to rise early in order to complete their daily chores that ensured their survival. In November of a year, winter sets in and there are only about 10 good hours of usable daylight. These people were not ones to waste a single minute of precious sunlight. At the time the soldiers attacked near 6.30 a.m., the women had been up, getting fires going, cooking morning meals, while young women were gathering clean spring water sparse driftwood, and buffalo chips for, fu for fuel. Often forgotten is that the women were the first to raise the alarm up the creek, um, they ra raised the alarm that morning based on the 675 horses they heard but could not see. These were galloping up the creek toward their village. They ran to the lodges announcing, the buffalo are coming. The teenage boys and girls were out after family and clan horse herds that had grazed through the night. There were about 200 adult fighting age men between 15 and uh, 65 in the village, and those have been witnessed by many of the individuals who actually were in the village. So the camp is roused. To further sympathy, writers have latched on to a misquote that the men were out hunting, or even that the, all the men were away. Therefore, out of the village, and implying its women and children were defenseless. The Cheyennes and Arapahoes were constant in their vigilance. Whether or not they felt relative safe in the protection of soldiers from Fort Lyon or in the bounds of their assigned reservation, it didn't change the fact that they were still surrounded by traditional enemies, the Pawnee, the Shoshone, the Crow, and the Utes. White men were only one of the groups for which they had to be on the watch. These people were industrious in their continual trade in horses and thousands of finished buffalo hides, large and small game hides, and had to be protective of their herds. Their herds here at Sand Creek were uh, uh, estimated between 1,400 and 2,000 horses. Their horses were a vital link in their economy, their individual and clan wealth. The horses were also key to their mobility and survival. As we look back from at least early as the negotiations with the thousands of Plains Indians for the treaty of, uh, as was mentioned earlier, Horse Creek or Fort Laramie in 1851, without respect for these people, Anglo-Americans tried to impose their idea of political organization on the Cheyennes and Arapahoes by asking them to assign one spokesman for each of their respective tribes. The idea of a head chief or head of state was not how the tribes governed themselves. In the example of the Cheyennes, 
the Council of 44 previously mentioned here today, is governed in which no single man was the chairman. But trying to push an English idea of elected officials carried over onto the subsequent narrative about the Cheyennes. Therefore, the temporary village at Sand Creek in 1864 was Black Kettle's village or camp. It was much easier for the politicians and the press to assign one man's name to the group than it was to differentiate or understand that Sand Creek, at Sand Creek there were about 20 chiefs and headmen representing a dozen or so family and clan groups. Black Kettle's family group, the Wutupiu, or Eaters, was only uh, one of the several camps in the village at Sand Creek. Although Black Kettle was among the more influential chiefs, he was not the chief. He was not the mayor. He wasn't the governor. Um, writers have fallen into the idea that each subgroup of Plains Indians were under the leadership of one man. So we often read about Red Cloud's people or Sitting Bull's camp on the Little Bighorn. It is so much more convenient to our conventions of order to refer to Black Kettle's camp than to try and understand how a group of people could be governed and spoken for by a council deliberating for the whole. By using one name, it is also more convenient to assign blame and responsibility and further reduce the need to understand the other group's social structure that is as complex in its familiar, familial and group functions and relations as ours. By extension, some writers and historic public officials have come to the illogical conclusion and before Congress that if the Dog Soldier Warrior Society men were all Cheyennes and Black Kettle was the chief of the Cheyennes, then Black Kettle had responsibility for and exercised authority over the Dog Soldiers. So every attack that the Dog Soldiers committed should be thrown onto the mantle of Black Kettle. Likewise, writers have ignored the fact that the dog soldiers were a minority outcast warrior society and that only one dog soldier headman, Bull Bear, was in the village at Sand Creek. Then again, because George Bent, the son of William Bent, an owl woman, who was, he was in the village, was a Cheyenne, he must have been a dog soldier, which he was not. George was a Crooked Lance Warrior Society member. He may have later accompanied dog soldiers on their uh, revenge raids or their reprisal raids, but he was not a dog soldier. On the other side, as a way to explain what happened, mitigate blame or culpability for the attack, massacre, and subsequent mutilations, we often see the soldiers cast as drunkards, ne'er-do-wells from Denver, saloons, and gutters. After all, they had to be. I think it was previously mentioned. They had to be either good men or all bad men. They had to be bad men to commit such unspeakable acts. The soldiers were actually a virtual cross-section of Colorado society in uh, the Colorado Territory at the time. They were mainly farmers, ranchers, and miners, and some of those that were already in service. The troops who were there have been lumped together as either all bad men, bad men or good men who went temporarily insane or evil with blood in their eye in sort of a mass hysteria. In a subtle way, to defer responsibility, they are regularly called militia, or Shivington's militia. The reason for this term was to plant an illegitimate term with an incorrect implication that these soldiers were somehow less than real Union or U.S. soldiers. Again, remember, fundamentally, these were blue-coated Union soldiers who were at that time nobly fighting the free slaves and save the Union. In fact, the 675 attacking troops were from the 1st and 3rd Colorado Volunteers. They were United States Volunteers in the chain of command of the U.S. Army and War Department. As previously mentioned, the United States federal government has never denied responsibility for what happened at Sand Creek, and the U.S. Army and federal government have never denied that this was a massacre. There were pundits and so forth in the day of the, the newspapers and so forth that did. Many enlisted men who returned from Sand Creek spread the word of the unmitigated slaughter of women and children. Professional soldiers and officers at field and staff levels quickly denounced the massacre as an outrage for the unwarranted killing of noncombatants and for its officers' betrayal 
of the army and government's word to the people it was sworn to protect. There were soldiers at Sand Creek with conscience, honor, and courage who stood down at great risk to their own lives, as Dr. Hallis was just talking about. These soldiers could have been summarily executed on the field for standing down. It is incorrect to say that all the soldiers committed the atrocities or participated in the massacre. As many as 125 men from Fort Lyon refused to participate in the massacre and subsequent mutilations. There were as many as 50 to 56 Hispanic soldiers in the 1st and 3rd Regiments, most of them from the Arkansas Valley. But we have no record or testimony of them participating in the killings or mutilations. We do believe that they may have saved a couple of the children in the village and took Charlie Bent into their custody and protection. From some soldiers' descendants, and this is one of the unique things about working at the site, is that from some of the soldiers' descendants, we have first-person accounts now coming out, diaries and testimonies uh, to family members and so forth, of men who refused to fire or who made attempts to stop the shooting or were so devastated by what they saw at Sand Creek that they became changed or ruined men for the rest of their lives. Some became preachers. Others were suicidal for the rest of their lives, much the same as we see returning veterans today. As well, there were other individual soldiers who ardently condemned the actions of Colonel Shivington until the day they died. There are many other misconceptions and conspiracy theories, too numerous for me to talk about today. But remember this about conspiracy theories, and I speak from uh, years in law enforcement, the interesting thing about a conspiracy theory is that you don't need an ounce of proof or evidence to allege one. So the Sand Creek history has, is full of them. However, to disprove a conspiracy theory, you must have find stacks of evidence and documentary proof. What I would like to go through quickly here is some historical realities. Uh, first, Colonel John Milton Shivington, commander of the expedition, and Colonel George Laird Shoup, commander of the 3rd Regiment, or 100 Dazers. And incidentally, Mr. Shoup's statue is over here in Statuary Hall in our Capitol building. Uh, they were never tried in court, nor were there court martials for either. There were, however, six investigations. There was an initial but cursory investigation conducted by the district inspector, Captain Henry Booth. There was a military investigation conducted by Major Ed Weinkoop under the orders from uh, <coughs> Colonel uh, James Ford of the 2nd Colorado, who was district commander. Then there was previously mentioned the Joint House and Senate Committee on Conduct of War, Joint House and Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, which was also known as the Doolittle Commission. And I might throw a little aside there. The Vice President of the United States, Lafayette Foster, actually visited the Sand Creek site in 1865. That's how important it was. A military commission was impaneled by the Department of Kansas, U.S. War Department at Denver and Fort Lyon, and an investigation conducted by the U.S. Army Advocate General's Office. Some of these are significant, and this is, this is work we've been doing continually for the last 15 years. And these are our best estimates to this point. There were about 700 to 750 Cheyennes and Arapahoes in the village at Sand Creek, or about 150 lodges. There were probably a disproportionate number of widows and orphans because it was a chief's camp. There was at least one family of Kiowas with two, lo two lodges. One of our most important findings, and this is significant here, is that we've been able to um, find names that are associated with those killed and present. Mr. Craig Moore, who you'll speak later, his dogged research over the last 30 years uh, is, uh, deserves the highest praise. There, uh, there were about 200 uh, Cheyennes and Arapahoes who were killed at Sand Creek. Of the 200 killed, there were at least 50 men. There were like numbers of women and children and elderly um, 
in, in both groups, uh, the killed and the wounded. Um, the soldiers, uh, okay, wait, okay, I'm getting a high sign. Okay, the massacre landscape, this is, this is disturbing stuff, and this is a stunning reality about the site, is that the massacre landscape covered between 35 and 50 square miles. It lasted about nine hours from 6.30 in the morning till about 3.30 in the afternoon. I want you to think about that when you go home to a house that sits on six to an acre somewhere in the suburbs. I mean, this is a huge area. There were no trees, no snow-capped mountains, no babbling brooks, no snow, no ice, no rocks, and nowhere to take cover. Um, I would like to make a conclusion that um, the things that we tell people at the Sand Creek kind of stem from a thing that uh, Little Raven was quoted as saying, I want to tell you this because I believe if you know it, you will correct the evil. For historians and historian writers, often the story of Sand Creek is crafted through intention or simply by repetition of incorrect history. The misconceptions have been furthered to vis by the visual images we have been given through inaccurate films aimed at soliciting emotional and entertainment value. These manipulations or embellishments do nothing to further our understanding or purpose of protecting and preserving this site of profound implications. There are no easy answers about Sand Creek. The answers can't be found by willfully ignoring history's continuum or choosing parts that fit our own personal conventions of truth. I would like to close with two things. One thing, actually. And that is a, a quote that I often use when I close the presentations at the site. As we're standing next to the burial ground or repatriation where the Cheyennes and Arapahoes bring remains that have been given back to the tribes for burial. And as we're standing there, I remind people of what was said by Edmund Burke. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Thank you, Jeff.